Hello everybody, uh, Keith Taylor here, Extension Professor at the University of California, Davis. I'm excited about this series. Uh, we're, we're interviewing electric co-op leaders uh, around the United States in conversations around the energy transition that's occurring. Uh, part of the point of this series is to educate folks about the utility sector, but also electric co-ops in particular. Electric co-ops hold this unique space where they can help out communities in the transition, meet public policy needs, while also hitting various climate targets along the way. Uh, with me today is Donna Walker, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Hoosier Electric. Uh, Hoosier Energy is actually the official title. Uh, but thank you for being with us today, Donna. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, you know, Donna, before hopping in and talking about you, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what is Hoosier? Yeah, so Hoosier Energy is a uh, generation and transmission cooperative, and we're a non-for-profit organization, and we actually provide um, electric power and services to our 18 member distribution co-ops, um, who are located in the southern half of the state of Indiana, and also in southeastern Illinois. And we have about 1,700 miles of high voltage uh, transmission lines. Our assets are right about 1.7 billion. We have over 500 million in annual revenues and we employ over 400 folks. So where I'm at in California, when people hear about electric utility, they think PG&E. PG&E is a massive investor-owned utility. Hoosier is not an investor-owned utility. It's a distinctly different business model. Can you talk a little bit more about what makes that distinctly different from so, shall we say an investor-owned utility or a municipal utility? Right, so yeah, there are some really important and I think special differences between electric co-ops and investor-owned utilities or municipals as you point out. And so when you think about the co-op um, business model, it actually came to be in the early 1930s, so a little bit of history because I think it's important to understand where we came from to understand where we are. And back in the 30s, there uh, wasn't electricity in in the rural parts of, of the nation. And so you had local groups of individuals that came together and formed distribution co-ops that then they could bring the power to the rural homes and farms and businesses. And so they were actually the folks that put those poles up and strung the wire to, to electrify rural America, which was a pretty cool story. And then when you think about the generation and transmission cooperatives, uh, once these local distribution co-ops came to be, they realized that they really were bound to buy their power from an investor-owned utility, a very large uh, organization. And so they wanted more control over their destiny. And so several local distribution co-ops then came together, those same folks, and said, hey, we want to have some scale and we want to actually build our own generating stations and build our own transmission line to take more control, lo more local control over that part of the business. And so that's how Hoosier Energy and Generation and Transmission Cooperatives came to be. So with that backdrop, a little bit more about the business model that includes both generation and transmission co-ops and distribution co-ops is that we are um, locally owned. We are owned by the member consumers that we serve. And so uh, the local consumers own the member distribution co-ops. They elect their directors from among themselves to represent them, and that's their governing board over their organization. And then from those local distribution co-op boards, they elect a representative to sit on the GNT board. So they're making the decisions about their power supply which I think is very, very cool, because our owners are our consumers. When you look at an investor-owned, an investor-owned utility has kind of divergent competing stakeholders in its business model. They have the rate payer, who uh, definitely wants cost to be as low as possible, and then they have the shareholder who wants profit to be as high as possible. Well, we don't have rate payers and shareholders. We have member owners, and so we're non for profit. And I think that that's a very cool business model. You know, that's interesting. Uh, you know, pointing out the difference between who has a voice at the seat at the table. So, at the investor owned utility, you're going to have the investor, but with the electric cooperative, it's actually the rate payer at the end of the line. What I think is what, what's happened in conversations I've had with folks when I talk about the electric co-op model, they tend to dismiss the competencies of investors. Uh, you know, of course they're qualified to serve on the board, but then people are critical of 
everyday rate payers serving on the board of an electric cooperative. My understanding is that in electric cooperatives, there's a lot of trainings to get people up to speed. So you can take this everyday rate payer, and all of a sudden they're kind of an expert board director. Can you talk a little bit about that? How do you onboard uh, new board directors and what kind of trainings and expertise is out there in this area? Oh, I think you've hit it spot on. I mean, you think about, um, again, the group of member consumers that own the local distribution cooperatives and then the fact that, that the GNT's board are governed by those same folks. I mean, they elect um, the, the business leaders in their communities to serve on the boards. And I mean, they are the, they're rate payers themselves, so they have great perspective in terms of what the community needs, what the issues are, uh, what the member consumers are looking for, as well as their own business backgrounds that they bring onto the board. And then when you look at the education that's provided about the electric industry overall, it's, it's expansive. I mean, there are national training programs and certifications that local directors can go through. Even at Hoosier Energy, we do special orientations for directors coming onto our board to educate them about the issues that are taking place currently in our industry, to make sure that they have you know, all the information that they're going to need to make decisions about our business. And so we have a lot of local training. Uh, training programs occur at the state level as well. So it is, the, the training programs are really expansive for directors. And they commit a lot of time to that. They spend a, and dedicate a lot of time into the education part um, of their responsibilities. I, I've been to a number of uh, national level conferences with the electric cooperatives. I uh, went to one governance conference and I believe there was something like 8,000 board members that were there. It's just a remarkable amount of folks to me, this, it, it strikes me as this is a system of American democracy we're not really talking about. We talk about elections, we talk about government, but democracy doesn't just happen necessarily through government, right? It would appear as though the electric cooperatives are another conduit for that. And the reason why I think that's important is uh, when I hear of critiques of electric cooperatives, one of the things that will pop up is uh, they're not regulated. Many states, they're not regulated under public utility commissions. I think the executives such as yourself might contest whether or not they're regulated. Can you talk about how the democratic features come into play and how that fits into this regulatory picture? Yeah, you know, I think that there is a fair amount of misinformation out there about the fact that um, electric cooperatives aren't regulated. So when you think about it, when you think about investor-owned utilities or public power entities or electric co-ops, electric co-ops are subject to the same reliability, resource adequacy, safety, environmental uh, workforce, all of those same types of regulations uh, that the other types of business organizations are. So we are very well regulated on that front. Um, and so we apply, we have the same rules apply to us as they have applied to them. I think where some of the confusion comes up is when the discussion is around rate regulation. And while those frameworks can vary from state to state, a number of states are like Indiana. And when you think about an investor-owned utility who will file a rate case, a request to change their rates with their public utility commission in the state of Indiana, that's the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, or IURC, um, they'll file their rate case. And what that public venue allows to happen is a balance between those two divergent stakeholder groups that I mentioned before. And so it's balancing the desire of the rate payer to have the lowest possible rates with the shareholder who wants the highest possible returns. And so the Public Service Commission serves to kind of balance that out and make sure that things are fair and reasonable, right? When you look at electric co-ops, because we don't have those two separate groups, because the member owners are the rate payers, then there's really no need for the Public Utility Commission to serve as kind of a referee in that, because the same folks who pay the rates are making the decisions about what those rates should be through the Board of, Re board of Directors. And so the board is really the regulator. And that's why the state commission doesn't regulate rates, because the state said, we didn't really need to. There's not a need for us to referee that type of discussion, since you have the same people, again, making the decisions about what rates they are going to pay through their utility. So that participatory feature is what allows everyday ratepayers 
to come to the table and help to determine their own rates then. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's, when we talk about the differences in the business model, that's the really cool thing about it is that locally, those people are sitting at the table making the decisions. And when we think about local distribution co-ops, they're in locally making decisions in their community, and then they're sitting at the table at their generation and transmission cooperative, like Hoosier Energy, again, making the decisions about their power supply future. So uh, it's very unique, and it's very grassroots. So it, it makes sense to me, uh, under this model, why it is that uh, the board working with executives and management would work to keep rates reasonable. Uh, what about another counter where if the rate payers are at the table, they're going to push to have unreasonably low rates? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that really makes it work in the co-op business model is, is because folks are invested in their local communities. I mean, they are living there, they're working there, their families are there. They have a long-term investment in the success of that organization and their community. And so when they're making decisions, they're looking at things on a longer term. It's not just what is the lowest possible rate today. It's what's the lowest reasonable rate that also gives us the future that we want in our community. So I think it's really that natural long-term view and investment in their communities that makes it work. So um, you're an executive here with a Generation Transmission Cooperative. So it's a second tier cooperative, one might say. So it's a co-op of co-ops. Uh, you talked earlier about what it is that the GNT does generally, but there's a lot more detail of what goes on here. I, behind us, you know, we have this big truck. Uh, you know, we're, we're here in a you know, service garage. Uh, you have bucket trucks that are out there. You're working in transmission lines and all these sort of things. So you're pooling purchasing power, but you're also providing power at the same time. You, can you talk about just the array of things that a second level co-op offers, it's local member co-ops, and why that matters to the ratepayer at the end of the line? Yeah, so when you think about um, the story of how co-ops got started that I, that I shared a little bit ago, that was really local individuals coming together to get the scale, to form their distribution co-op, to electrify their communities. And then when those local distribution co-ops to, came together to form the generation transmission cooperatives, again, that was about, hey, let's pool our resources together and get the scale to approach this in a, in a more cost-effective way. And so they've continued to carry that philosophy forward. And so as we look at the generating resources, the transmission resources, uh, supplying assistance to the distribution co-ops in times of storms or disasters. There's just this pool of resources that they can draw from that would be much more costly if they had to set up that infrastructure 18 individual times as opposed to 18 of them coming together and sharing in those resources. So they get more services at a lower cost by joining their power together. And so you're right, you know, you see our operations that are kind of around us today. But in addition to the generation, the transmission, the nuts and bolts of our business, they also use their generation and transmission cooperative for scale for other types of services. So we talk about whether it's education or communication types of services, um, economic development types of activities, uh, having key accounts managers, folks with expertise that they can share in a pool at the GNT that can then serve their local co-ops. So really our members have taken advantage of the scale that they have here at Hoosier Energy for a whole variety of services that we provide to them. And so again, that serves to provide great service to their local communities at a lower cost. Especially being in a place like California, you hear a lot of folks talk about things like distributed energy, they want to do rooftop solar and this sort of thing. But me, being in California, even though I'm a professor, I'm renting. I can't afford a house there. That means I can't afford to participate in that. My understanding is that GNTs allow that ratepayer to participate in some ways in this energy transition in interesting approaches. And I think Hoosier's getting into solar, some of this. It, it, can you talk a little bit about some of Hoosier's uh, renewable energy portfolio and what you're doing there? Right, so several years ago, one of the first things that we did was uh, working with the member systems, we actually created 10 one megawatt solar uh, projects 
distributed throughout the service territory. And then, uh, so that was kind of our first foray into distributed generation. And those projects have been really successful, not only for the solar power that they generate and produce, but also as education tools. I mean, we have a number of community organizations, school systems that will come to visit the solar arrays for education. We've tried some different agricultural uh, types of pilot projects at the facilities. So that was kind of our first step into uh, distributed renewable resources. As we look at all the changes that the industry is going through currently, which is to open up and, and move away from just the concept of large central station generation to more opportunities for smaller types of installations, even down to the residential, not just solar panels on your rooftop, but also using devices like smart thermostats or electric vehicles and associated batteries. You know, we're working with members to try a number of pilot projects throughout our system so we understand how those uh, appliances and how those distributed resources may work on our system. Because when you think about it, the large electricity system and grid that we have as a nation today was built for very large generating stations and for power to move one way. What we're talking about in the future is for power to move two ways. You know, and so how's the system going to perform? We want to make sure it's still reliable. We want to make sure that we do things in a very cost-effective way while meeting end consumers' expectations. So it's a really exciting time, and as we work through the pilot projects with our member systems, that's going to put us both in um, a great setting to be able to know exactly what we can do and how to do it well for end consumers. So it's a really complicated time, but it's also a very exciting time. Good. That's really interesting because, uh, as you're alluding to, the way the grid used to work, it was very asynchronous. It's kind of one directional, and now it's multi-directional. At the same time, you need to have someone that's kind of the, the traffic keeper, traffic guard along the way. There's obviously governmental governmental organizations that come into play, but if we look at just things like the utility commissions or even the ISOs, for example, uh, you know that doesn't paint the rich tapestry of what's out there. There's all these other kind of NGOs or nonprofits or co-ops that are playing in this system. And my understanding is that Hoosier has been involved in helping to build out and add capacity to the overall grid. So it's not that you're just facing the consumer, you're also facing the grid at the same time. So uh, one of the stories I heard is that Hoosier was uh, part of the original group of utilities that helped to form the MISO, the Midwest ISO, uh, but also ACES Power Marketing. And I'd like to hear more about that. Like, what, what are the support organizations that are out there that you're taking this second level of co-op, you're basically developing a third and fourth level, and you're contributing to other kinds of institutions? Can you talk about that, too? Yeah, so let's start with, with the MISO. And so you're right, Keith, we were one of the original transmission system owners that that helped form MISO. And we were right there alongside investor-owned utilities and municipals, and so from the beginning. And um, you're right, there's a lot, there are a lot of operational considerations that the folks in the trenches that are operating the power plants and operating the large transmission system really have to have, to have a, a role in that to make sure that things work well. And I think what we've seen through the creation of MISO and then as it evolved from a transmission organization now to you know, a wholesale market um, in and of itself, we've seen that that scale, so the theme of scale again, has really brought a lot of benefits to us. Um, and so when we think before MISO was, uh, in place, we would have to set aside so much generation on our generating units to be able to accommodate um, a disturbance on our system or if something happened, right? So you'd have to have all these reserves setting, set aside, which was pretty inefficient for smaller systems. When you take our small piece and then you expand it to multi-state footprint and MISO, we can all share those reserves. And so what that does is, again, it makes things much more efficient and much more cost effective for everybody. So it's been exciting to be part of MISO from, from the beginning. Um, do we love everything that happens at MISO? No, it's not, it's not all perfect. Most things aren't. But it's definitely the benefits have outweighed you know, any of the challenges that we've seen through MISO. 
kind of that same concept with the creation of ACES Power Marketing that you mentioned. So ACES was formed by a group of uh, generation and transmission cooperatives across the country. And we said, look, if we can come together and we can have one entity that can have the systems to interact with the power markets like a MISO or PJM that's just to the east of us, these power markets, it's much more cost effective than if all 20 of us had to have separate systems and separate people to actually interact with the markets. So ACES is another form of scale, being able to, you know, kind of hit above your weight, so to speak, in the markets. And ACES is also, with their view across the country, they can see and understand risks and things that are different among markets. And so we can all share that information and say, this is something that we need to be thinking of here where we are. It hasn't come to us yet, but it probably will. Or this is something that we can share, we're experiencing to others in different places. So it's been a great network of sharing of information and actually sharing of resources, human resources and talent, as well as systems. So in this way, uh, as you can structure out this network, it sounds like it, it allows you to kind of offload some areas where through pooling, you could get better efficiencies and then you could for focus on some of your core competencies and do that with excellence in that arena. Yeah, that's I think that's a great way to, to describe it, yeah. What I think is interesting about something like an ACES too is my understanding is the GNTs came together to form ACES but it's not just the GNTs to get a play in it. Other utility forms can actually participate in the ACEs as well. And this is sort of a way that the electric co-ops have created additional capacities in the grid. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? So as ACES built its capabilities to serve the GNTs that formed it, um, it also realized, to your point, that they could provide services to non-GNT types of organizations. So they do have customers that they can also then kind of share those services with um, and as they, you know, sell those services and provide those services to others, it just further reduces the cost for the GNTs that are part of ACES. But again, you know, the structure of ACES is that those GNTs sit on the ACES board and they make the decisions about the direction of ACES. So it's very much the same cooperative type of governance structure that we've been talking about earlier. And what I think is interesting about these models is that whenever the cooperatives own them, uh, the cooperatives aren't out there to extract value, extract profit, so much as add value and to drive down the cost. And that's something I think isn't talked about a lot. Because when the investor owns play, it makes sense. At the end of the day, uh, their big obligation is their shareholders. Their shareholders want that return on investment. Your obligation isn't a return on investment, it's a return on value to your local members. Can you talk a little bit about that mediating effect that happens with the electric co-ops when they're at the table? Right. So, um, again, as a non-for-profit, you know, our we're not driven by profit motives. Now, uh, we do have uh, a bit of profit or margin that's built in just our business model, right? Because you have to have cushion in case the unexpected happens, as non-for-profits do. But with the economic participation of our members, any types of margins or net income that we would make, that actually gets returned right back to our member owners. And so that's kind of the, the cycling of how that happens. It goes directly back to them. So again, I think that focuses on like the least cost, risk-adjusted way of doing business, looking at things for the long term, recognizing that anything that, that does come into the cooperative goes right back to those member systems. And so um, I think that that's, a, that's something that most people don't understand about the co-op model and how that works. I want to shift over to talking about the energy transition. Uh, right now, the electric utility space is going through this unparalleled transition uh, that rivals what happened in the 1930s. And as you noted, 1930s, that's, I think there's kind of three major phases of the electric utility space, right? There's the creation of it, there's sort of the 1930s with the growth of the electric cooperatives saturating the rural countryside. You know, getting that, was it 90% of the rural countryside did not have electrification? and as the electric co-ops have brought that. And now what we're facing is this shift from centralized spoke and hub style of energy generation, transmission, distribution, to now this two-way asynchronous. Can you talk about, you contextualize that a little bit. What, what is it that the everyday rate payer or even advocate of this transition, what is it you think that they're not aware of 
the challenges in this space? Yeah, you know, I think a, a very fundamental challenge, and, and I realize this as, you know, we've talked to uh, different legislators over time or, or regulators in, in different aspects, but just the fact that most Americans don't realize what goes on behind flipping the switch and the lights coming on. And there's not, there's not a storage of that electricity, um, aside from some battery storage that's starting to, to come into play now. But what has to happen to make sure that at any point in time, when all those people are turning on devices, that the generation is actually happening in real time. And that's a very complex, complicated system that when you think about it, it's amazing that we have the reliability that we do here in the United States, you know, that we take for granted. But I think that's fundamentally, if people don't realize how complicated just the physics is around electricity production and transmission, um, that can get lost. And so when we start talking about this major transition to use this very complicated grid in a different way, in order to maintain the reliability that we've all become so used to as part of our society and our economy, it's gonna take a lot of work to make sure that that is still there. So it's taking it from the theoretical, let's have all these new players come in and this will be great to all these new players are in, but we've gotta make sure everybody still has the same reliability focus and um, making sure that that happens is not gonna be an easy task. It's exciting and I think there's lots of opportunities, but we have to be realistic that some of the things that we would like to happen as a society overnight are gonna take some time, again, to make sure that we have the same amount of reliability that we've had in the past. When I think of complex systems such as uh, energy systems, I tend to think of it as an exercise in herding cats. And it been the, with the conglomeration in the energy sector, especially amongst investor owns, there have been fewer and fewer cats over the years. But now with new distributed, you have new market entrants, you know, famously Tesla is a big one that's in there. But now you have everyday consumers that are wanting to participate in that. Can you talk about some of the complexities of this cat herding and why it is that it's disrupting the sector and the challenges that that brings with it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, there's a lot of a lot of potential. I think when I have seen major changes that have gone on in our industry, you know, over the past 20 plus years since since I've been part of it, oftentimes when you have new entrants in, there's there becomes a lot of misinformation that that is out there. Um, not saying it's intentional, but just misunderstandings of the complexity and so forth. And so um, consumers are told, oh, you can do A, B, and C, and it'll be easy, and it'll be quick, and this is what you'll earn from it. The, the, real, the reality and the practical side of it is that there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes that's going to need to happen. And sometimes that leaves consumers feeling frustrated, right? And so one of the things when I say that it's gonna take some time, I think, there's going to need to be a lot of education at making sure that consumers have good information to make their decisions about how they'll be able to participate in new areas of the market. And you know, FERC is, is making moves to open things up to more entrants and participants and consumers in the market. And I think that that's a good thing. And, um, but I also say, we need to make sure that people have the good information to make good decisions and that we maintain a reliable electricity supply. So when you think, for example, of all these different folks now coming into the space, we hear so much in the news about cybersecurity and the disruption that you know cyber threats can pose. When you think about all these new spots that people can participate, those are new spots for, you know, cyber events to happen. And so those are examples of things that we really need to be mindful of as we move towards transitioning into the future. Sometimes I think folks can read that as the utilities are, are saying no. I don't see it that way. I certainly don't think about it that way. I think that just because we've seen the complexity and we live in that space every day, we're just saying yes, but let's be mindful and let's be very thoughtful about how we do it. You know, I think one of the great stories here that kind of highlights this is a recent movement around the coal-fired power plant that was in Hoosier's portfolio. Uh, I would love to hear from you about what that all entailed. What, what was the, what's this story about and how does that highlight the challenges of the energy transition but also the interesting opportunities that are out there with the transition. 
Our decision that we announced uh, back in January of 2020 uh, to plan to retire our Merrim Generating Station, which is our last coal-fired uh, facility, but it's a, it's a major facility for us. That plant, the two units there, represent half of our generation mix, and so that, that was a big decision. Uh, most utilities that are making decisions about a particular plant, it may represent just a small fraction of their supply, but this was major for us. And I'll just kind of step back to how we got to that decision. It was actually a process that took nearly a year. And so I think it's a great showcase of how the governance structure works in the co-op model. Because when we sat down at that very first board meeting to talk about this long-range resource planning process that we were going to undertake to look at all of our resources, the very first thing that we did was sit down and talk about what is the most important to the consumer at the end of the line when it comes to their power supply resources. And so once we decided and determined what that was, that then became our scorecard to evaluate alternatives in front of us. And the types of things that our board and our, the CEOs of our member distribution systems who engaged in that discussion, they decided that low wholesale rates, uh, rates that are stable and predictable over time, diversity of resources, so we've been predominantly a, a coal utility in the past, but a diverse set of resources was important, as well as sustainability. And so those were kind of the four factors that became our scorecard to weigh alternatives against. And so uh, after that first meeting, we embarked on an 11-month process where we really looked at what was going on in uh, the market, the MISO market around us, as well as nationally. What could the future look like? What are different scenarios that the future could play out? Um, one of which was, you know, much more distributed types of resources, all types of future scenarios, and then looking at our alternatives and how they fared based on, again, what was most important to those end consumers. And so that led us to the decision that we made. We're retiring uh, our Marin plant in 2023 and moving to a more diverse portfolio uh, that would include more wind and solar, continue to include natural gas and battery storage was really the mix that we think is, is best for, for our consumers. And another element of our plan as we started down that planning process, the board decided, look, if at the end of this we decide that we do want to make a change to our resource mix and that impacts employees, community members, right? then we're going to treat those employees fairly. And so that was an important part of our decision as well, that to the extent that we have employees impacted by Miriam's closure, we're going to treat them fairly, and that we're going to look at programs to help them transition into the next chapter of their life. So I think what we went through as far as coming to our decision to move to a different portfolio was also a great example of how governance works in the co-op, and that it truly is always focused on what does the end consumer really want? Because that's who we're here to serve in the communities where they are. You know, I think that, that's one aspect of cooperatives in general that a lot of folks aren't aware of. First, that cooperatives are predicated on these seven cooperative principles and their values. And that one of these principles is concern for community. It sounds like that is what's permeated a lot of the governance process. So yes, you're facing the energy sector and yes, you're making decisions based on that. But at the same time, because the local ratepayers serve on the board, this keeps Hoosier in check, so to speak, but also rooted in its community, what Hoosier wants to do for the community. So with the closure of the coal fire power plant, y'all are giving a lot of deep introspective thought to what's happening to the workforce there. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening with that? Sure. I mean. Um Again, you know, the board's view was, look, we want to make sure that we treat employees fairly. And so we worked with the IBW to actually come up with a package of assistance, an assistance program for our union workforce that's impacted by Merrim's closure. And so we think that, that that is something that will, again, help those employees transition into their future. Because at Merrim Station, we have employees who are early on in their careers. We have employees who are, you know, very nearing retirement, and all in between. And so we wanted to make sure that there was something there for everybody. Um, and part of the assistance program was retraining. 
And so one of the things that we did early on was we partnered with Indiana State University to create a uh, emerging energy technology certification program that was open to only Miram Station employees that could retrain them for skilled positions in other areas of our business where we really have a need uh, in the meter relay and communications areas of the business, which are growing because of all that distributed work that's coming at us. And so that was something that we offered to employees as an example of if you're interested in a, in a career opportunity elsewhere, you have access to this program. And we knew with that program that Hoosier Energy probably couldn't employ all the people that we could get through that program, but that was okay. We have need, but the broader industry has a need. And so if we can help an employee move into a skilled position with, a, with another utility, that's okay too. That's a win, right? And so those are some examples of, of what we've done with the program. We also developed similar assistance uh, program for our non-union workforce that will be impacted by Miriam's retirement. And I think that that's given the employees, we just finalized that uh, a few months ago, and I think that's given them some certainty as we move towards the ultimate retirement of the plant. Again, we're expecting that to be in early 2023, um, that they know what the landscape is as they, move, as they move toward that, because we're continuing to operate the plant today up until that point. So for me as a displacement Westerner that's now on the West Coast, uh, what I really like about this story is that it shows that there's these Midwest innovations that are coming out that often get overlooked in this energy transition conversation. Uh, it also shows that despite all of this, shall we say, angst that's hurt happened in the Rust Belt, where people think that as we go through this transition, it's a zero-sum game, it doesn't have to be. If you have the right stakeholders at the table and we do these things intentionally, the energy transition can actually be benefit. It could drive economic development. And I think that's kind of a heartening story in all of this. I, I want to pivot briefly over to talking about Hoosier's community impact. It's my understanding is that internally to Hoosier, you have an economic development team. So you're working on things with the grid, you're you know, facing your rate payers, you're trying to help them while helping, but through helping your distribution co-op members. Can you talk about what you're doing on the economic development side? Yes, Hoosiers had a very active economic development uh, function for decades now. And uh, we've been very successful at it, working with our member distribution cooperatives to attract new businesses, uh, shovel-ready sites, you know, a, a very robust economic development type of, of feature. And so that served us really well in the past. Um, you know, however, it, and it will continue to serve us well in the future, but I think it's going to look different, you know, as perspective, uh, industries have all kinds of new things that they're looking for. They may have their own sustainability goals and own types of community involvement that they're interested in. I think that that's going to showcase and we're going to be able to tailor our programs rather than having kind of a, a massive program. We'll make it more individualized to what their needs and wants are. I think the days of having an economic development rate, that's been a very important feature to attract new businesses into our service territory and the service territory of our members. Um, that served us well, but again, I think we're gonna need to change that up and tailor that. And so I'm excited about what economic development is going to be in the future. So um, it's been one way in the past. I think it's gonna look very different in the future uh, to make sure that we continue to be successful. But again, as far as attracting new businesses in, it's as much about the jobs that it brings to the community and the benefits that it brings to the communities as it is about selling electricity. And I think that that is very different for co-ops than it is for other types of utility business organizations. And so um, we talked about the retirement of the Miram Station. Another thing that we're very actively pursuing, working with state and local economic development groups, is to try to attract new industry onto that site. Because there's um, a lot of, of potential benefits there. There's already water treatment facilities. There's access to water there. There's access to rail facilities. There's lots of things that make it very attractive to industries. And so we've been active on that front, too, to try to bring in a new industry onto the site that, again, will bring some jobs um, that won't necessarily be there at Merrim as an operating plant anymore. I think, you know, Donna, one of the other areas uh, folks say it needs a change in the utility sector is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You coming in to Hoosier, you're the first female CEO to serve in this role. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, 
when people look at the landscape of utilities in general, they tend to look at it as kind of like a, a kind of a white male terrain. I, I'd like to talk a, with, a bit with you about that, about what your own trajectory is in this space. Can you talk about your background, where you come from, and kind of your role as being a female executive leader in this position? Yeah, so um, I actually grew up in a small town that's just about an hour south of where we're sitting here today. So uh, I'm a native of the Hoosier State, and um, I'm an Indiana University grad, so I've always kind of stayed close stay close to home. But I actually grew up working in my dad's general store, and uh, that was before the days of the big chain stores, box stores, and so forth. So everybody in the community, you know, came into my dad's store to get whatever they needed from toothpaste to lamps to lawn mowers to whatever you needed. Sort of the old school Walgreens, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I remember working in dad's store where um, if there was a fire, for example, somebody in the community had experienced a fire, um, dad would say, you know, come in and get what you need. And that's what you did for your community. And so I kind of, I grew up with that's how you, that's what you did. And um, so when I went off to college, I uh, got my degree in business from IU and entered the world of public accounting. I was with the National Public Accounting Firm for about nine years. CPA, and I got to see a lot of different industries and businesses, and that was that was good experience. But I really kind of wanted to focus on one particular industry uh, as opposed to kind of a broad brush and, and be with one company. And so the opportunity came up close to home at Hoosier Energy for the manager financial services role, and uh, I stepped into that. I joined the company. It's been just over 25 years now, going on 26. And I remember when I left public accounting, my, uh, some of my colleagues said, oh gosh, Donna, aren't you gonna be bored doing the same thing every day, you know, day after day? And I am not kidding, when I look back over almost 26 years, I literally do not think that there have been any two days that have looked alike. It's been, it's been very exciting. And, um, you know, in a co-op our size, we deal with all the same issues that the investor-owned utilities and very large utilities deal with. We just have fewer people to deal with them. So I realized if you roll your sleeves up, you can participate and you can work on almost anything. And I was very blessed to be able to work on a variety of different projects about the company that really helped expand my view beyond just the finance piece of the business. Um, Things like process improvement at our at our Miram station. We were going through a series of some outages many years ago, and we were trying to figure out the root cause. And I was able to I was able to work on that and um, a number of different projects along that along that route. Um, but I kind of go back to how I was raised, and you know, growing up in small southern Indiana town, um, it was just my sister and I, and my parents never said, you know, there's you can't do this or you can't do that, or you shouldn't think of doing this or that. And I don't ever remember having a conversation with mom and dad about it, but there was always understood that my sister and I were going to go to college. Like, you, you can pick what you want to do, but you're going to go to college. And so um, I guess I didn't know there were limitations. And I think that that was very freeing because I chose my path in the business, um, business world, and my sister chose her path in the medical world. And you know, now there are so many women in, you know, whether it's public accounting or in the medical field, but you know, when we were making those decisions 35 years ago, there really weren't. Um, and so I guess being naive to the fact that there were limitations served me pretty well. And uh, you know, you're right, it, whether it was public accounting and now in the utility space, there were uh, many times when I would be the only woman in the room. And you know, I never felt uncomfortable about that at all. Um, I felt like my ideas were respected, um, just like anybody else's ideas. And it's been super exciting for me, having been in this space for a number of years, to see the numbers of women growing uh, in the field. And so, you know, we have um, women directors, we have women board officers, we have women, CE women CEOs at our member distribution co-ops. And so it's great to see that happen throughout the space. Um, there's more to be done. You know, but we're definitely uh, moving along that path, and it's an exciting, an exciting time. One thing I tell women, uh, because I'll, I'll get asked the question, well, what advice would you offer women who want to move in the space? And I always encourage women to really go for the opportunity. And 
you know, there have been studies that show that women don't tend to apply for positions unless they feel they're fully or almost fully qualified to step into it at that moment. Men don't view it that way. Men view it as, hey, when I get there, I'll figure it out. What I tell women is, you'll figure it out. We all figure it out, right? And so don't limit yourself. I think when I applied, you know, for um, the CEO position at Hoosier Energy, there were nearly 100 applicants, I believe, and I think that there were four women that applied. And so what I tell women is you've got to, you've got to apply, you've got to put yourself out there. That's the first step, right? And then making sure that the opportunities, you know, are there and, and so forth. But I always tell women, go for it. You'll figure it out. You're smart. You literally had a 4% chance. <laughs> <laughs> On that scale, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so with the partnership I'm working on with Professor Gabe Chan out of University of Minnesota, we have a lot of students that are very passionate about this space. They want to get involved in the energy transition. Uh, I think my generation, but especially this, particularly this younger generation coming up, it feels like the ladder was pulled up, you know, after the generation before them, uh, especially in kind of like industrial areas, it, uh, industrial Rust Belt kind of regions. But the electric co-ops, I'm seeing a lot of really great opportunities. There's a, they're, they're calling it you know, the silver tsunami, and there's a lot of folks that are retiring. But with that, I'm seeing leadership such as yourself that are really kind of reaching out and saying, please, come along. You know, this is an opportunity. And it seems like this is a really rich territory for younger folks or ambitious folks that want to participate in the energy transition, but also to give back to their community. Can you talk about these various diversity, equity, inclusion opportunities and just kind of career opportunities that's out there in the electric co-op space? Sure. I think, you know, um, Keith, a lot of times students don't understand uh, all of the skill sets that it takes to run an electric utility, right? And so obviously you see the line workers out, you know, uh, doing during their jobs and so forth. But what we've tried to do is to work with area high schools as well as, you know, universities and colleges in the area to let them know the broad scope of skill sets and talents that we're really looking for um, to run our company. So whether that's, you know, on the tech side, a lot of technology related jobs, right, in our space. And I think that's only going to continue to grow. Uh, there's communications, there's finance, there's marketing, there's all kinds of opportunities at, at electric utility. So again, one of the things we've been doing is really trying to get out there and get that story out there to high school age students that there are opportunities. And not all of them require four year degrees, you know, so, so there's something for everybody to your certification, some technical types of training. So there really are a lot of opportunities for students. But I think it's upon us to get our story out there more at the right point so that students can make those decisions as they're thinking about what they want to pursue, you know, after they leave high school. You know, and, and with that, uh, just do you mind briefly talking about uh, where it is that students can end up working and what kind of the career tracks look like in this space in general? Gosh, with all of that breadth and scope, uh, you know, let me let me pick one. So if I pick, uh, I'll pick my finance background, right? So you know, if you are interested in something along the financial or the accounting type of uh, track to get into an electric utility, right? There are opportunities to be rate analyst, right? Pulling our rates together, working on our treasury, financial planning types of aspects in the business. Um, there are accounting positions that you can go into. And so you can follow that track. And here's what I think is really cool, again, about electric co-ops. Because we have all of the challenges that very large utilities have, but fewer people to do them, you're going to have the opportunities to expand those skill sets. So in my example that I gave earlier, I was able to step outside and use the background that I had in kind of a finance and accounting area and apply that and work on a process improvement initiative at a power plant. Now, I knew nothing about operating a power plant. I think, you know, when I first walked in that first day as project manager, they were kind of like, what is she doing here? <laughs> but we realized with those talents and working with cross-functional folks in the company, you get to experience things that folks at an investor own would never get to see that scope and breadth. And you get to do that much earlier on in your career. And I think once you see those areas, it'll help you decide, hey, I really like the track I'm on, 
or I didn't even know this track was out there, this area, and I'm really interested in that. So I think that's one of the really cool and exciting things about a co-op. So, Donna, is there anything else you want to cover in this that you think is important for the general audience to know about? Um, gosh, no, we've covered a lot of territory today, that's for sure. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about our business and, and what we do because we're super passionate about it. Um, but I do think that it's kind of a hidden type of thing that we do and that a lot of people don't don't really realize what goes on again behind that light switch. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about it.